This program is brought to you by Stanford University. Please visit us at stanford.edu. Well, thanks very much. I, I really appreciate everyone coming that's here. Uh, I realize it's the day before Thanksgiving, and I think it must have taken a special effort for many of you to come, and I, I really appreciate it. Um, I have two interests. Uh, one is in my research life. One is uh, tuberculosis, and the other is cholera. And these are vastly different organisms, uh, very different modes of pathogenesis and epidemiology. <clears throat> and today I'm going to speak um, on cholera and on um, sort of reflect on what I've learned from having worked on a project in Bangladesh uh, on this disease. And what I'm going to attempt to do is make a case for uh, bringing together uh, diverse disciplines to understand complex problems. And also, I want to acquaint you with the concept of what I call crossing scales, by which I mean from the uh, global scale to the molecular scale in order to comprehend a, a phenomenon of nature. So I'm, um, I'm going to do this, or try to do this, by first uh, beginning as we do begin typically in medical grand rounds, by presenting a case to you. Um, this is the case of a 58-year-old Bangladeshi rice farmer um, living um, in the community near where I work in Matla, Bangladesh, um, approximately um, 70 miles from the capital, Dhaka. Um, this is his case. Uh, just as we do in uh, morning report or medical grand rounds, this gentleman uh, presented with a purging diarrheal illness and vomiting of 48 hours duration. Uh, when he was seen in the Mutlob Health Center, uh, he was found to be febrile, obtunded, and profoundly dehydrated. Um, his course was very brief. He expired within four hours. Uh, he could not be rehydrated, and his state of uh, cardiovascular collapse from dehydration simply couldn't be reversed. However, a stool culture was obtained, and a, uh, not surprisingly, the organism isolated was Vibrio cholerae. However, um, this organism uh, proved to be atypical of the um, uh, epidemic strain that had circulated for the past uh, 100 years or more in South Asia. It was not the typical El Toro one strain, but some entirely new Sira group, and it was designated Bengal, because this is the Bengal region of South Asia. It was given the numeric designation 0139, and the, um, I'll be reflecting on what this means uh, a little bit later in the talk, but from this poor gentleman's perspective, the significance was that although he had been exposed repeatedly to the epidemic strain that had been present in this region for years, the O1 sera group, that exposure conferred no immunity to him, to this new sera group, and thus, even though he was um, uh, had immunity to the prior strain, uh, suffered a severe illness and died. The context for this case is that it occurred in October 1993, and that's a very special year in the history of cholera, because that's the year when this brand new pathogenic type of vibrio cholera first appeared and precipitated epidemics in the region. Uh, he lived in the Gangetic Delta of Bangladesh, one of the largest uh, delta regions in the world. He was a rice farmer in a rice farming community that lacked sanitation and access to clean drinking water. Uh, this illness occurred in the immediate post-monsoon period when typical endemic outbreaks of cholera are common in this region. Uh, and this case was, uh, this year, the endemic cholera epidemic was especially severe and uh, focused on adult working males rather than young, non-immune children, as was usually the case. So I'm going to try to uh, talk about this case 
in terms of what I began with, the concept of crossing scales and disciplines to, emer to understand the emergence of this new pathogen. <clears throat> and the disciplines that we will proceed through briefly are pathophysiology, epidemiology, ecology, and the evolution and spread of a new pathogen. And then we'll try to contextualize these processes in an environmental framework. So first, um, I'm sure, since many of you are physicians, you don't need an introduction to the disease. But I have a special perspective on this illness that begins with the kind of stool that patients with cholera produce. This is the typical rice water stool from a cholera patient. It's very similar to if you were to rinse Asian rice a few times, you get this white opalescent uh, rinse fluid, and that's where the name comes from. But if you were to peer more deeply into that stool by putting a drop of it on a microscope slide and staining it with a gram stain, you would see countless numbers of comma-shaped organisms. And this is the Vibrio cholerae um, organism responsible for the disease cholera and which sickened this patient. When that patient was ill in Bangladesh and before he uh, was so sick that he could not walk, he would typically uh, use the hanging latrines of Bangladesh. Um, he would uh, go up on this bamboo pole, uh, shield himself behind some old saris, and defecate these rice water stools directly into an in, uh, aquatic environmental habitat, in this case, something in the region that's called a tank. It's really a large pond. And so we have um, the following scenario uh, that occurs commonly in such a region. We have um, an individual consuming from an environmental aquatic reservoir water that is contaminated with this organism. The infectious dose is approximately 100,000 bacteria, at least in North American volunteers. Uh, 24 hours later, after profound replication in the human small bowel, the output from that single patient would be 20 billion bacteria. So that the human intestine functions in an ecological context as a kind of amplification system for this organism in nature. And uh, not only that, but the organisms that come out have been proven to be more infectious and more virulent than the ones that were first consumed from an environmental habitat. And that's because in interesting genetic changes occur upon the passage of the organism through the human intestine. So it produces more organisms and organisms more fit to uh, spread through human populations. Let's turn a moment to the epidemiology. This is a 100-year portrait of the geography of endemic cholera in South Asia. And um, you're all familiar with this region, India, the Bay of Bengal, from which this terrible cyclone uh, was launched in the last week that struck this part of Bangladesh right here, the most southern part of Bangladesh. This is the epidemic center of cholera in the world, and it is from this center that most epidemics spread globally to become pandemics. And we're in the, uh, either the beginning of the eighth or the end of the seventh cholera pandemic right now. And they, they are launched from this region which has special environmental and ecological features that nourish this organism. Those features are largely due to the confluence of two great river systems, the Ganges, shown here in the Brahmaputra River that joins it in the lower one-third of Bangladesh to empty into the salty waters of the Bay of Bengal. This is one of the largest estuaries and delta regions in the world. And of course, the population of Bangladesh is currently approximately 140 million, most people living right in this region. So this is a region where endemic cholera occurs periodically in a cyclic fashion time to the monsoon season. So I want to acquaint you with what that monsoon season is like in this part of the world. Many of you perhaps have experienced this firsthand. Some of you come from this area. Um, but we'll begin here. The monsoons are characterized by extremely heavy rains and flooding. Uh, the heavy rains sweep over the entire region of South Asia. They rain heavily in the Himalaya foothills. Because of deforestation, uh, 
those waters are progressively flowing with greater velocity and sediment into the uh, Gangetic Delta area. It begins with rains in June, that's the peak in August, and then decline in September. The post-monsoon season then follows between October and December, and it's in this period that uh, cholera cases begin, uh, peak, and then spontaneously decline by December. This is the major peak of cholera cases, always occurring in the immediate post-monsoon period. And then it's followed by the hot, dry season, a small peak of cholera cases, and then once again into the monsoon season. So this phenomenon of timing a climate cycle with an epidemic infectious disease is fundamental. And this is the hypothesis that now is proven, I think, pretty much beyond any doubt that climate acting on aquatic reservoirs where this organism resides causes it to emerge as a pathogen and spread through human communities. So I wanted to give you a, a bit of a, a more personal feeling for what it's like to be in this region during the monsoon and post-monsoon period. So this is a photograph that I took um, two weeks or so before the beginning of the annual cholera outbreak in the immediate post-monsoon season in the uh, research site at, in Matla, Bangladesh. And you can see there's lots of water. This is a little tributary of the Ganges River. Um, uh, people navigate during this time almost entirely in boats of various types. This is a satellite photograph at the same time and you can see, this is the Bay of Bengal, this is the state of West Bengal in India, Myanmar or Burma shown here, and this of course is uh, Bangladesh with the community of Matlab indicated. Um, you can see all of this sediment washing down from the Himalaya foothills and the beginning of a vast algal bloom uh, in this satellite photograph in which the satellite camera is able to image chlorophyll pigments as they enter in, uh, at the Bay of Bengal. The um, same community uh, six months later during the dry pre-monsoon season can be shown to be vastly different. The homes now are suspended on uh, supports 20 feet above the water level, which has declined. The water has become progressively influenced by the Bay of Bengal. It's now salty, and all organisms living in the water have had to adjust to this uh, dramatic shift in the biochemical environment of that habitat. And that leads us to consider the ecology of this organism, which has as its reservoir natural aquatic habitats. We could say uh, that within water, it is a good citizen and a member of a complex ecosystem. In our bowel, it's a deadly pathogen. Um, so we have this, um, this simple scenario with which all of you are acquainted. A cholera uh, patient produces contaminated feces that contaminates water, that infects other patients. They contaminate food, that infects other patients and they shed their contaminated stool into these aquatic environments, um, initially through things like the hanging latrine of Bangladesh and then in other ways as well, through groundwater contamination and so on. Um, and I would like you to imagine yourself for a moment in Bangladesh, uh, standing at the edge of this estuary just prior to the onset of the uh, annual cholera outbreak, put on the lenses of an ecologist, and this is what you would see. So the first thing that you would appreciate is a dramatic algal bloom in many of the algal, in many of the aquatic habitats, the streams, rivers, delta area, even the marine uh, and coastal region will uh, uh, have algal blooms, and you're all familiar with this. You may be familiar with it in your own swimming pools. You certainly, Lake Lagunita experiences this, and you'll see it uh, throughout the United States in the um, late spring and early summer months as well. And if we uh, consider what's going on in an algal bloom, the phenomenon is, um, in some sense, relatively simple. 
Algae being a simple plant engages in photosynthesis. It needs sunlight and uh, carbon dioxide, uh, and it needs to be provided certain um, nitrates and phosphates, which may be in limiting amounts uh, in the environment with or, where it resides. So um, if there is sunlight, the provision of limiting nutrients, mainly nitrogen in this region, nitrates, algal blooms occur naturally. And this is timed with the parting of the monsoon clouds so that the uh, illumination of these aquatic habitats become intense. And it's also created by intense runoff from the monsoon rains that carry these nitrogen-rich chemical fertilizers and human and animal waste into these aquatic habitats, uh, which in effect fertilize the small amounts of algae that are initially there so they grow to become abundant. I'm going to return to this uh, theme that is the relationship between the use of chemical fertilizers in South Asia, the so-called green revolution that made this region food independent in the 1960s, and the precipitation of algal uh, uh, blooms as a consequence of that green revolution and how this has affected the epidemiology and evolution of verbial cholera in a few moments. But first, I want to simply uh, suggest to you that the relationship between vibrial cholera and algal blooms is a very intimate and very ancient one. This is the zone of uh, symbiosis. Vibrial cholera, this is the um, algal organism Anabena variabilis. These are the vegetative cells. They're green because they contain chlorophyll. This is the nitrogen-fixing uh, structure called a heterocyst. And typically in this region, vibrio cholera binds and forms large colonies right at the junction of the heterocyst and the vegetative cells. And it gains from this relationship the products of photosynthesis that are leaked from this junction, which it uses as nutrients and grows to large numbers. It also uh, contributes to stabilization of the nitrogen-fixing enzymes within this heterocyst. It's a true example of symbiosis. Algal blooms, however, are not stable, and they undergo an evolution when they outgrow their nutrients. And Vibrio cholera that was once associated with the algal blooms then move to the predator of algae in the region called copepods. And this shift of Vibrio from algae to copepods is something I want to discuss now because it's fundamental to the ecology of this organism. So we must ask ourselves, what is a copepod? So copepods belong to the class Crustacea, which come in two flavors, large and small, okay? The large are crab and shrimp, uh, which you're all familiar with, and the small, the largest um, group of the small forms of Crustacea are, uh, is the family Copepodia. And the reason these are important for us to understand is because they harbor Vibrio cholera. So, um, I wanted to show you a copepod magnified, of course, at uh, several thousand fold, which I collected from Monterey Bay. This is the common copepod worldwide called Tigreopus californicus. And now you can see that this organism uh, looks very shrimp-like or lobster-like, but the thing I want to point to you is its exoskeleton. This is what you remove when you peel a shrimp or take the carapace off a Dungeness crab. And the reason this is important is because it is composed largely of a polysaccharide polymer called chitin. And chitin can be degraded by Vibrio cholera for food. The reason this is important from a sort of mass perspective is that copepods are the most numerous animal in the world. And the reason they are is because marine environments are vast, the oceans are vast, and these are common invertebrates in oceans where they swarm by the billions. The reason chitin is important from a global perspective is it's the second most common uh, biopolymer in the world. The most common is this stuff right here. This is cellulose. Um, chitin is the next most abundant in the world. And if you were to add, as I did, verbial cholera to a culture of swimming copepods, within a few hours, what you will observe is exactly what you see here by scanning electron microscopy. This is a copepod now magnified 
to such a large great, uh, degree that you can see it's armed for combat in its marine environment. This is its chitin exoskeleton. And all of these structures are Vibrio cholera that have homed to the chitin surface, uh, bound it, formed a colony, and begun to divide. And I want to consider that process and why it's important for us to know about in just a few moments. So this process of chitin utilization by Vibrio cholera could be understood at the biochemical or genetic level. And indeed, it's quite well understood. It can be broken down for our purposes today into three important processes. First, the organism Vibrio cholera, as shown schematically here, senses the presence of chitin and of copepod carapaces and copepod molts in a marine environment. It moves quickly toward them, swimming with lightning-like speed, um, using its single polar flagella, attaches to the chitin surface, begins to multiply, and then um, a complex biochemical and genetic program is launched, uh, and it progressively degrades chitin down to its constituent sugar in acetylglucosamine, which passes through the periplasm and into the cytoplasm of verbial cholera, where it's assimilated as a source of carbon, nitrogen, and energy, and the organism grows. So we have this simple schematic of verbial cholera binding to a copepod molt in an aquatic habitat in Bangladesh and using it as a nutrient function. More surprisingly, something else quite important happens as well. It initiates a genomic program. It allows this organism now to reach out and grab DNA circulating in that environment, internalize it across its cell envelope, take it into its cytosol, and have it recombined into its chromosome. This is a genomic function which in more scientific and microbiological terms is, uh, we would say, the presence of chitin for this organism induces what's called competence for natural transformation. The genes acquired from the environment are, are used either to enhance and diversify its genome, the first requirement of Darwinian evolution, or to repair damaged genes. This is a kind of horizontal gene transfer that bacteria engage in that allow them to quickly take in large blocks of genes that can transform their phenotypes in dramatic ways, including make them more pathogenic. The way this happens is shown here in environmental um, environments uh, where there are many organisms. Some are dying. They're releasing DNA into the environment. Uh, Vibrio cholera growing on a chitin surface can take up that DNA, uh, take it into its cytosol, and move it into its chromosome by a process we call homologous recombination. So this um, ability of chitin to drive the evolution of Vibrio cholera has two consequences. It can acquire genes that allow it to have new meta metabolic capacities and allow it to occupy new niches in the environment, or it can acquire new pathogenic traits. Uh, and allow it to better occupy the host niche. Since this is an organism with a split personality, part of it is an, as an environmental uh, commensal and part of it as a human pathogen. Both of these serve its evolutionary trajectory. So I want to tell you why this is important to the case I presented to you today. So um, this is a um, chart that shows the prevalence of vibrio cholera isolates from patients in a hospital in Calcutta. Calcutta is about 80 miles from uh, Dhaka, Bangladesh, and it's in the same ecological region, environmental region of, um, of Bengal, as is Bangladesh. Um, here uh, you will see the number of isolates as percents of two kinds of Vibrio cholera. First, the old type, we call O1 L tor, that had circulated in this region for years and years and decades and decades. And then the dramatic appearance of this new organism, Vibrio cholera Bengal, also called O139, that sickened and killed this patient. And we can see in 1992, at the end of the cholera season, a few cases of uh, Vibrio cholera Bengal were first detected. By 1993, it spawned a vast epidemic in the region. And then throughout subsequent years, 
it fluctuated from minority to more common uh, as we move through the, the next decade. And we have reconstructed in our laboratory what happened in an estuary, we believe, in Bangladesh that gave rise to this new strain. And it was relatively simple to do once we understood that chitin caused the organism to take up extraneous DNA from the environment. We took a harmless environmental strain that had the genes encoding this new sera group, 0139, of the Bengal new pathogen. We introduced it into a setting where Virbio cholera 01, the ancestral recipient that had been the cause of epidemics, uh, and we grew them on a copepod surface. This process of chitin-induced acquisition of genes occurred. It created a new strain. The new strain was identical at the genetic and genomic level to the pathogen that was isolated here in 1993. So important events that can influence human health can occur on the surface of a copepod. And I want to show you the consequences of events of this kind. If we track the spread of this new Vibrio collar 013 Bengal, which killed the patient I presented to you at the start, we can see, as best we can tell, the first cases occurred right here, both in Dhaka and in Calcutta. And then over the next 10 years, that organism spread to uh, most of the remaining parts of Asia. Uh, to basically precipitate a vast um, regional outbreak of this disease. So <clears throat> with that as a preamble or a background, what I want to do now is t put this in a larger and environmental context. We've ranged now between epidemiology, infectious disease, pathogenesis, molecular genetics, and evolution now I want to put this in the context, which I would call evolutionary sciences, and remind you that we've talked about the association of Vibrio cholera with algae, with copepods, its transmission to humans, and then, of course, the fact that rice water stools pass from humans back into the same aquatic environment where all of this process is uh, tra transpiring. And there are certain tasks that we can reconstruct that Vibrio cholera and its evolutionary wisdom has learned to achieve at each one of these steps. The first is its association with algae, which achieves for it biomass amplification. And I call this the controlling variable of this whole thing, because the more algal blooms there are, the more copepod blooms, uh, and the more likelihood will create uh, genetically diverse organisms that can spread more effectively to humans. The role of the organism in copepods, its ability to live on chitin and to become genetically transformable while on chitin, is a way for it to create genetic diversity. And I would remind you that the fundamentals of Darwinian evolution is the presence of genetic diversity plus natural selection, right? Those are the two pillars of Darwinian evolution. And then we have its transmission to humans where it can once again amplify itself by replicating at breakneck speed in the small intestine, doubling its estimated every eight minutes while there. It's shed back into the environment, now more infectious, more transmissible, more virulent for the next human host, but also in larger numbers. Um, so we try to understand that now expanding our vision even greater into a regional and global context, you'll see that I've focused the last 20 or 30 minutes on algal blooms, copepod blooms, transmission to humans, infection and disease. And the molecular and details of this process are reasonably well understood. But then there are all the regional and environmental drivers of this process. So just the drivers involve runoff, the use of nitrate-rich chemical fertilizers, runoff that carries human and animal waste that spawn these algal blooms. The runoffs are in turn a consequence of increasing irrigation. 
deforestation in the Himalaya foothills, um, monsoon rains, and the monsoon rains and their intensity are in turn a consequence of regional and global climate change. So um, what I want to show you, which is easy to overlook, is at the bottom, <clears throat> which I call our knowledge gradient. So um, knowledge gradient is interesting. We don't, of course, know everything in the world that happens with equal certainty, right? So we know a lot about this. The molecular pathogenesis of Vibrio cholera, I would say, is probably better understood than any other microorganism in the world. It's been the subject of wonderful work by many people over the last 50 years. It's really stunning. Um, this part <clears throat> of this model, we know a lot less about. <clears throat> this is truly a model. <clears throat> it is a conjecture. And I would have to say that in some sense, it is my conjecture, OK? Um, although, believe me, it's supported by a lot of strong and compelling evidence. It is still a model in the process of being tested. Um, so um, th there's one thing about this model that I, I really want to emphasize, is that this part of the model <clears throat> is um, under certain temporal, has a temporal profile. Um, it implies that changes in irrigation, changes in chemical fertilizer, and possibly regional and global climate change could alter the drivers in such a way that the downstream consequences would be either upregulated or downregulated. And I want to look at one aspect that focuses on irrigation and chemical fertilizers and how that may have changed during the last 50 years to drive this process forward. And that is the green revolution in South Asia. So we have two green revolutions. We've got Al Gore, right? And that's a fantastic new green revolution. But it's easy to forget that there was at least, I think, as important a green revolution in the uh, early 1960s. And this was a transformation of agriculture in developing countries. So you could break this down. And we have real experts at Stanford. If any of you know Wally Falcon, he was right there at the very beginning. He's an economist that really did a lot to get it going in India and Bangladesh. But it, it really is, was a transformation depending on the development of high yield hybrid rice and wheat crops, uh, the increasing use of irrigation, and the dramatic increased use of chemical fertilizers, mostly in the form of urea, uh, based on a German invention from about 1910 on how you could make urea as a chemical process, as a source of nitrate uh, to use as a fertilizer. And today, India alone uses more chemical fertilizer than all of Western Europe. In fact, a lot more. Um, the importance of this green revolution is it made these regions food independent. It banished famines from this region, which doesn't mean people don't go hungry, of course, but uh, nationwide or region-wide famines no longer occur because of this. The unintended consequences, the unintended consequences are adverse and ecological and public health consequences, okay? So um, green revolution is good, but increasing recognition is that it has consequence for the ecology and public health of people, largely due to fertilizer use. So I wanted to give you a quick glimpse of what that's like. And this is the kind of industrialized rice producing um, activities that go on in Bangladesh today in the region that I am working. Um, these are vast um, fields of rice that are heavily irrigated in the dry season and heavily fertilized with chemical fertilizers throughout the cycles. Farmers are now getting two or three crops a year, whereas they did not uh, before the Green Revolution occurred. 
And the question that we then can ask in this larger environmental or regional context is, can an economic decision by a Bangladeshi rice farmer to purchase fertilizers spawn an epidemic? Um, and um, that is the question. And not just cholera, but cholera is a particularly useful way of looking at that. If we go back to this model, we can see that the uh, new epidemic that we've started with and which we've discussed a few times in the last half hour uh, was the genetic transformation of Vibrio cholera to a new organism to which the community had no immunity and it spawned a large outbreak of disease that then spread through Asia. If this is true, then this may be enhanced as a diversification mechanism of this organism create new pathogens and the opportunity for um, increased epidemics of cholera-like illness. So that's what leads to this question, trying to see if we can go from here to here. And um, I want to close with <clears throat> how I think this needs to be done and return to what I began with. Uh, we can go f between those two points if we're willing to cross scales as scientists. So crossing scales is going from the regional and global to the molecular and genetic, okay? Crossing scales means that we understand in economic and agricultural and social terms events that occur in this region and how they affect the genome of an infectious agent. That's what crossing scales means. It means you can't just work in your lab as a molecular bi biologist or in the field as an ecologist, that somehow you need to encompass the skill sets and perspectives of both these disciplines. It also requires that we are willing to cross disciplines or work at the interface between disciplines where most of us are very uncomfortable to be because we have to learn new jargon and we have to um, learn new methods and techniques. These are the relevant disciplines that need to be encompassed in some way to understand or address that question. Economics, ecology, epidemiology, agronomy, which is the science of agriculture, environmental sciences, this blossoming area, molecular genetics, and public health. My view is that together, these can help us understand complex phenomena and devise interventions. And of course, Stanford is undertaking this um, experiment in interdisciplinary thinking at the Woods Institute for the Environment, which is this robust program that's building at Stanford now and which funds the work I've just described to you. So I want to close <clears throat> by um, showing you another a uh, photograph of Bangladesh uh, just to try to seduce students and young physicians into considering working in a third world environment as their career. It's a beautiful place out in the delta just as the monsoon season is parting. Um, it's green and it's uh, fertile and uh, the people are welcoming and um, it has transformed my life, uh, really, to work here. Thank you. The preceding program is copyrighted by Stanford University. Please visit us at stanford.edu.